Okay, we're going to be picking up in Habakkuk chapter 1 tonight. Habakkuk chapter 1. We're going to try to get through the book tonight. While you're turning there, as a matter of housekeeping, I want to let you know what we're going to be doing next. So scheduled next uh, was supposed to be Dan Byers, uh, and he will be in the book of Daniel. However, Dan and Ernestine will be going on their yearly trek out of town during the month of January. Um, and so we're going to hold off on Daniel until February. In the meantime, minus the congregational meeting coming up in about two weeks, I think it's two weeks, right? Two weeks away. Um, that gives us four more classes to cover. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and fill in for those four classes. What we're going to do, instead of covering a specific book, as we have been doing, we're going to look at the rest of what, what we've come to know as the 12, as in the 12 minor prophets. And we're going to go through the rest of those books and try to see a link between them that brings us to the New Testament. You know, one of the things we've tried to do with the prophets that we've covered thus far is in their place to get a sense of chronology, get a sense of setting as far as what's happening, and then that drives the prophet's message. And we really got a big sense of what the prophet's trying to tell us based on the current circumstances that they're in. However, the 12 prophets are no different than any other part of the Bible. They are meant to, well, at their time, they are meant to make us look forward to what is coming. We've talked about a great day of the Lord that is coming and how there have been many days of the Lord. Well, we know of a certain day of the Lord that happened 400 years after Malachi. And Jesus comes onto the scene. The Lord comes into his temple suddenly and dwells among us. And the prophets are pointing to that moment. Now, they, of course, do have a, an, an immediate message. And a lot of them have to do with judgment. They have to do with problems that are happening in those days or problems that will be happening or nations that are um, causing issues and have to be dealt with. But ultimately, what we're getting pointed to in all of these prophets is we should be pointing right back to God. We need to see in these prophets, in the major prophets, in all the text, from Genesis to Revelation, everything has to point us back to God or we've missed the main point. So what we're going to do with the rest of the, the prophets, it's going to be uh, very similar to kind of how we do in when we do spiritual heritage. We do kind of an overview. We're going to talk about the setting of those books, what's happening at the time, where they are, and then we're, we're going to be kind of more 10,000 foot view than we have been with Jonah and Nahum and Habakkuk. So that's going to be the uh, classes during the month of January, and then we will pick up with Daniel. And that should be a good segue for us into Daniel, uh, because Daniel is right there at the beginning of the Babylonian captivity. Um, and so we'll, we'll kind of get some, some things on either side of that. So that's the plan. Tonight, let's pick back up where we left off in Habakkuk. We left off in verse 12. Now, if you remember verses 1 through 11, this book is comprised of a series of conversations between Habakkuk and God. And so in chapter 1, the very, that first half of chapter 1, we had the first of those conversations. Habakkuk, in verses 2 through 4, asks the question, Lord, how can you sit back and watch injustice happen and do nothing about it? Well, God answers him, and he says, Habakkuk, you have no idea what I'm doing, and I'm going to tell you what I'm doing, and when I do, you're not even going to believe it. And so he tells him that he's going to judge Judah, and how's he going to do that? How is Judah going to be judged, or how is that judgment going to take place? What's that? With violence, and who is going to be perpetrating that violence? 
Babylon. That's right. The Chaldeans or Babylon. So verse six of chapter one, look, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter, impetuous nation that marches across the earth's open spaces. We talked a lot about Babylon last time. Now, Habakkuk's second conversation with God, he now has a response to the response. And so that's where we're picking up tonight. So let's begin in verse 12 of chapter one. Are you not from eternity, Lord my God? My Holy One, you will not die. Lord, you appointed them to execute judgment. My rock, you destined them to punish us. Now, who is the them? Babylon. It is Babylon. Okay. So, what does Habakkuk, how, how does Habakkuk characterize God here in verse 12? What does he say about God? How does he describe him? Okay, he's eternal. He is holy. And one more thing that he does. He judges. That's right. He judges. He is eternal. He is holy. And he is the judge. Habakkuk recognizes God for exactly who he is. Apologize. There we go. Yeah, Habakkuk recognizes God, acknowledges God for exactly who he is. He's the everlasting one, the one that lasts forever. He's the holy one and the one who executes judgment. But there's a problem. Habakkuk just can't connect some dots. So let's continue. Your eyes... The Holy One, your eyes are too pure to look on evil, and you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. So why do you tolerate those who are treacherous? Why are you silent while one who is wicked swallows up one who is more righteous than himself? All right, so, so what's Habakkuk's dilemma here? It's almost humorous, isn't it? What, what's the problem? Okay, not just one with another, but one less bad with one more bad. You're going to use a worse nation than us to punish us. He doesn't even call them less, but more, less wicked. He calls them more righteous. More righteous, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so he just went from, in verses 2 through 4, talking about injustice and violence and wrongdoing, oppression and violence and strife, to now saying one who is more righteous than the, the Chaldeans. I suppose that's one way that you could characterize that. Okay, so why do you tolerate those who are more righteous or who are more treacherous? Why are you silent while one who is wicked swallows up one who is more righteous than himself. Now, can, can we understand Habakkuk's reasoning here at all? What, I mean, what, what can we understand? How do we understand that? What? What's that? He has a personal connection. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if they're worse they should be getting the first punishment and then deal with the lesser evil, right? So it, it, it makes no sense. And not only that, but the, the more evil, as he says, is swallowing up. Now keep that image in mind because that's going to be a big part of the next part of this. Swallowing up. So it's like this creature or, you know, we, we looked at Jonah. It's like this fish that comes in and swallows this other nation and it ceases to exist. And so look, the, the next verse then, you have made mankind like the fish of the sea, like marine creatures that have no ruler. The Chaldeans, the ones that you are going to judge with, your chosen instrument, the Chaldeans pull up all mankind with a hook and they catch them in their dragnet and gather them in their fishing net. That is why they are glad and rejoice. That is why they sacrifice to their dragnet and burn incense to their fishing net. For by these things, their portion is rich and their food plentiful. Will they therefore empty their net and continually slaughter nations without mercy? 
So again, we can see Habakkuk's dilemma here. He has a difficult time reconciling what he knows about God, the Holy One, the Just One, with God's chosen form of punishment. And so he compares here Babylon then to a fisherman and the people of Israel to the fish in the sea. Really, this is all the people of the world, but specifically the people of Israel and Judah to the fish of the sea. He says the Chaldeans pull them all up with a hook. So we can see the fishermen, you know, he, he puts down his line and he just, he's just taking them out one by one, taking out those nations one by one and putting them in his, his uh putting them in his uh, hold. Um, and, you know, I don't know if this is, I don't know if this is necessarily tied, but how did the Assyrians take away captives to exile? With hooks, that's right. where they put the hook? In the nose, that's right. So they would either put a ring in the nose and then attach a hook to it, and that's how they would carry people away. And so in misery and humiliation is the idea there. And they would specifically do that to rulers. We actually see that happening in Scripture. Um, Manasseh is characterized as being carried away with a hook in his nose. Uh, but also um, Jehoiakim, I believe, is carried away to Babylon in the same way. So the Assyrians put hooks in the noses of captives to lead them away. And Judah, in Ezekiel 19.9, Judah is described as a young lion led away to the king of Babylon with a wooden yoke and hooks. And so this image of a fisherman pulling out fish with a hook, I think, has a double meaning to it, has, has kind of a double image to it. But that he doesn't stop there, okay? This is not just one person pulling out single individuals for captivity. He expands the image. I watched a YouTube video a couple of years ago of uh, deep sea fishing crews around Alaska. And so they're pulling up, I guess it's tuna or salmon or something like that out of, out of the deep sea. And I actually think this is a screenshot from that video. Seeing them process the sheer number of fish from the drag nets that they put down is astounding. These nets are so big that like seals and dolphins and things just get caught up in them. They just catch what they catch and it all comes in and they just have this giant machine that just spits them all into the hold of the ship. I mean, there are potentially millions of fish in these nets. And so Habakkuk has this image. Babylon is not just a fisherman's hook. They are a fisherman's net sweeping through the water, indiscriminately gathering fish. They don't care who they're getting. They just want more. And they're going to get as many as they can get and just pull them all into their clutches. And so Habakkuk's problem then is Judah will be swallowed up with no regard for the righteous or the unrighteous. God, if you are just and you reward the righteous and you look out for the righteous and you punish the unrighteous, how can you use a nation that doesn't care about either of those things? All they're going to do is sweep through and take out anybody in their path, regardless of whether they're good or bad. That's Habakkuk's problem. So to Babylon, that net, their brute strength and their overwhelming numbers, as Habakkuk says, that's their God. Their strength is their God. They don't believe in anything else. They have no fear for anything else. They don't care. All they care about is their strength and exercising it over the nations. So here's Habakkuk, then his second dilemma then. How can God judge slightly more righteous Judah using treacherous heathens? Aren't they worthy of worse judgment? And as he says in verse 17, will they therefore empty their net and continually slaughter nations without mercy? If you swallow us up, the righteous nation, won't Babylon just keep doing this over and over again to nation after nation after nation? How is your plan playing out that way? Doesn't make any sense. Okay, so chapter two and verse one then. Habakkuk says, 
I will stand at my guard post and station myself on the lookout tower. I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I should reply about my complaint. Habakkuk says, God, I'm at a loss. I've got nothing. And so Habakkuk's at his wits end. He's dumbfounded. So he's simply going to set himself on a wall and he's just going to watch as if he's in a guarding tower and he's just looking out to see what, God, what are you going to do? You know, either I'm going to see you save us or I'm just going to sit here and watch the nation come up against us. But I'm going to wait to see what your response is. Yes, yes, it is. That is true. I need to know. That's right. I need to know. Yep. Jonah has a preconceived notion of what he thinks is going to happen. And so he waits and watches for judgment. And then Habakkuk uh, has no idea. <laughs> He just, he, he just can't even imagine it. So he's going to wait to hear God's reply in the hopes that it's going to make sense and that he'll get some satisfactory answers. Now, if you have read through the book, is Habakkuk really going to get an answer? I mean, in terms of, hey, uh, two plus two equals four, Habakkuk. Um, this is how it's all going to play out and add up. No, he doesn't. He doesn't really. He does get an answer, though. And so let's look at that. Chapter 2, verse 2. The Lord answered me, write down this vision. Clearly inscribe it on tablets so one may easily read it. Now, we asked this question before. Why would it be important for Habakkuk to write this down, you think? Okay, because it's going to happen, and... For the future. So people will know that God's word came to pass just as he said it would. And his plan still played out. Okay, so, so there's going to be evidence. It's a testament to God's faithfulness for future generations. All right, so write down this vision, clearly inscribe it on tablets so one may easily read it. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It's not happening yet. It testifies about the end and will not lie. Though it delays, wait for it, since it certainly will come and will not be late. And so we read about this appointed time. Now, again, as we talked about the, that day of the Lord uh, previously, whenever we see a day of the Lord happen in Scripture, is it ever a spontaneous occurrence? I see, I see a shaking head. No, it's, it, is there always a warning about that day of the Lord? I mean, even in, even the flood, was there some form of warning for the flood? Well, I mean, you see a guy sitting there working on a boat for a hundred years, uh, and he's probably telling people about what's coming. These days of the Lord are not spontaneous events. This is not sinners in the hands of an angry God, and he suddenly gets angry and strikes people down with lightning. There's always an appointed time. And so God will always say, hey, this is coming. Believe that it's coming, and there is a time and a place when it will occur. Now, there have been times, well, I, let me ask the question. Have there been times when a day of the Lord has been either delayed or abated? Yes, there most certainly has. Yeah. And what's usually the cause of that? Repentance. Okay, we saw that in Jonah, didn't we? Okay, repent, because in 40 days, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. Well, was it destroyed in 40 days? No, because they repented. Okay, so it's not that the Lord was untruthful or uh, short-sighted or anything like that, but there was a potential change um, that could take place in that time. So that being said, God is always waiting for a time. His judgment is never sudden. Okay, so the appointed time. Habakkuk's original complaint, though, was about God's inactivity. It's not that he was acting too suddenly. It's that he wasn't acting at all in Habakkuk's view. 
Okay. Was God inactive? No. Is God ever inactive? No. Okay. God wasn't inactive, but Habakkuk's perspective and his timetable just weren't big enough. The time for God's action against Judah and against Babylon has been set, and it is coming soon. All right, let's pick up in verse four then. Look, his ego is inflated. Who's the he? Who are we talking about here? Then we're still talking about Babylon. That's right. Okay. Look, his ego is inflated. He is without integrity, but the righteous one will live by faith. Okay, now this, this seems like kind of one of those things that's just kind of put in there. Contrast between the inflated ego, uh, and we, we saw how Habakkuk uh, talked about, or I'm sorry, how God talked about Babylon in chapter 1 and verse 10. They mock kings and rulers are a joke to them. They laugh at every fortress and build siege ramps to capture it. This is an arrogant nation. Okay, So contrast between that inflated ego and then the righteous one who humbles themselves in faithfulness. But let's ask this question here. We're kind of in the midst of this indictment against Babylon and God explaining to Habakkuk what is sure to come. Why is this here right now? Because right after this statement, he's going to go back and start talking about Babylon again. Why is this here? To the okay. And so what is Habakkuk's dilemma? What was his dilemma before this statement? I, I don't know what's going to happen. How are my people going to survive this oncoming Chaldean attack? And God's answer is, how is the righteous one going to survive? He's going to survive by faith. How has the righteous one always survived? How has Israel continued to exist? By faith. And I would, I would also throw out here, not just faith, but the word here is in the, the, the tense of the word implies faithfulness. Okay, the righteous one will live by his faithfulness or by his faithfulness, the righteous one will live is kind of more closer to the, the context or the syntax. Um, so, so, yeah, I think Eddie's exactly right. The reason this is included right here is this is the answer to Habakkuk's original question. And so we've led up to the answer. And now we're going to also pull away from that answer. The righteous one is going to live, but other things are going to happen too. And that's the rest of God's response. All right, so the time for God's action has been set. And the emphasis in the Hebrew text is on the word live. What part of God's action am I going to fall on? Am I going to be the arrogant one who's going to fall under judgment? Or am I going to be the righteous one who will live by their faith? Okay, so in judgment, the faithful remnant are those who will live and return. And we, you know, we see that term throughout the Old Testament, those who are the faithful remnant. Um, I can't remember the, I believe this is Isaiah. I will gather the remnant of my flock from all the land. No, I'm sorry, this is uh, Jeremiah. I will gather the remnant of my flock from all the lands where I have banished them, and I will return them to their grazing land. They will become fruitful and numerous. All right. I want to move on from this for, for just a minute. We'll, we'll circle back around to this statement because it's pretty key to our understanding of the book and to where we're going to go from this. Jeff almost stole my thunder this morning. So we're going to circle back around. Hopefully you were listening this morning. That was an excellent uh, segue into our, our book tonight. Uh, so I, I commend that lesson to you. All right, let, let's continue then. All right. Verse five. Moreover, wine betrays. An arrogant man is never at rest. He enlarges his appetite like Sheol, and like death, he is never satisfied. He gathers all the nations to himself. He collects all the peoples 
for himself. All right, so we go back to this description then. We're still talking about Babylon with this description. All right, now, what does wine betrays have to do about it? Well, if you look in history, Babylon is known for their uh, infatuation with alcohol. They love getting sloshed. They love having parties. They love imbibing, whatever you want to call it. Can you think of an example of of one of those Babylonian parties? I see Eddie shaking his head. Okay, Belshazzar, right? Daniel chapter five. If you remember, Belshazzar's there partying with his friends and they're all getting pretty tipsy. And what does he do in Daniel five? He goes and gets the implements from the temple and starts drinking out of those as if there's some sort of common beer mug. Then what happens? You get the writing on the wall. That's where we get that, the, the uh, phrase there. You get the writing on the wall, right? And so he is judged. And that very night, everything's taken away from him. So isn't it interesting that in God's judgment that he's giving to Habakkuk here, one of the very main things that he mentions is their uh, love for alcohol. And that directly contributes to Belshazzar's fall on the night that he dies. Uh, and he, they're taken over by the Medes and the Persians because he's, he's in a drunken stupor at the end of that night. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, Babylon's known for its drunken revelry. He goes on, he says, an arrogant man is never at rest. Why is, a, why is an arrogant man never at rest? What does an arrogant man want? More. Okay, there you go. He always wants more. Why? To feed his ego. Okay, yeah. Because he's always striving for more. You know, there's that, uh, that kind of, I don't know if it's a parable or story or whatever, but you ask the, the arrogant or ask the man, how much is enough? A little more. Always a little more. And so it's never, ever going to be enough. You ever, when you were, some of you may or may not. When you were kids, you ever played King of the Hill? King of the Mountain, whatever you want to call it. Okay, you didn't ever play that? None of your grandsons ever played that? I'm sure, well, I'm sure they did. Okay, so, you know, you find you a spot that's kind of raised up and one of the kids gets up on top of it and all the other kids try to knock him off or push him off or get him down so that they can get up there and be the king of the hill. And so this game is just a constant striving for someone to be the person on top. Now, when you're the person on top, what do you got to do? You just get to sit there? No, what happens? You always got to keep fighting, all right? It's this constant struggle to just be on top. Now, if there is anything that I think the Ecclesiastes writer would refer to as vanity, I think that's it. You can have all the things in the world, but somebody is going to come along and yank you down. And you may get it back, but somebody else is going to come along and take you down too. So an arrogant man is never at rest. Babylon is never going to be at rest because they always want more, more, more. And so the image here then, he enlarges his appetite like Sheol. What is Sheol? It's death. It's the grave. Yes, it's death. Uh, he enlarges his appetite like Sheol and like death, he is never satisfied. All right. So, so from Eden, when has death stopped? Uh, just in terms of normal everyday events. I know there's a couple of aberrations there, but it, it hadn't stopped, right? It just kind of keeps going. There is one thing that is common to all of us. Again, going back to Ecclesiastes, we're all going to go to the grave. And so the grave never stops swallowing. It never stops taking. And so that's how he characterizes Babylon. Sheol, the grave, is like a ravenous animal opening its enormous jaws, but its hunger is never, ever going to be filled. Uh, filled. Isaiah 5 talks about that. My people go into exile 
because they lack knowledge. Therefore, Sheol enlarges its throat and opens wide its enormous jaws, and down go Zion's dignitaries, her masses, her crowds, and those who carouse in her. Now remember, he's talking about God's people there. We're going to come back to that in just a second. But like a black hole or a bottomless pit, he gathers all the nations to himself. We can almost see these arms, and he's just all this is mine, this is mine, and he collects all the peoples for himself. However, look at verse six. Won't all of these, who are the these? If we have a pronoun there, what do we need to go back to? Who are the these? The people that he's collecting, okay? Won't all of these peoples and nations take up a taunt against him? with mockery and riddles about him, right? So, so what we're seeing here then is now a glimmer of what's coming. We have this nation that's an overwhelming force that just swallows up everything that's in front of them, leaving nothing for anyone else in their wake. And God says, even the very people that they conquer are going to turn on them and laugh. And they're going to ridicule them. Why? Well, what we get here in God's next, uh, next part here is a series of five woes, five woes, okay? And each of these is for a component of Babylon's um, shortcomings, all right? So woe number one, woe number one, they will say, woe to him who amasses what is not his, how much longer? and loads himself with goods taken in pledge. Won't your creditors suddenly arise and those who disturb you wake up? Then you will become spoiled for them since you have plundered many nations and all the peoples who remain will plunder you because of human bloodshed and violence against lands and cities and all who live in them. And so we, we have, you know, again, them taking things that aren't theirs, but, but he even goes in and says, won't your creditors suddenly arise and those who disturb you wake up? We're talking about, Usury and unjust lending happening within Babylon. Woe number two, verses nine through 11. Talking about ill-gotten gains and economic oppression. Woe to him who dishonestly makes wealth for his house to place his nest on high to escape the grasp of disaster. That's that king of the hill mentality. I'm stepping on you so that I can get to the top. Woe to that person, he says, by wiping out many peoples and sinning against your own self. Woe number three, verses 12 through 14, a woe against violence. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and founds a town with injustice. Well, we saw that in the very first Babylon, didn't we? When Cain's descendants built a city and they built it on the backs of other peoples. And in violence, those cities grew and grew after the flood. Woe number four, carousing. This would be related to the alcohol consumption. Woe to him who gives his neighbors drink, pouring out your wrath and even making them drunk in order to look at their nakedness. You will be filled with disgrace instead of glory. You also drink and expose your uncircumcision. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you, and utter disgrace will cover your glory. And then woe number five, verses 18 through 20, the worst one of all, idolatry. What use is a carved idol after its craftsman carves it? It is only a cast image, a teacher of lies. For the one who crafts its shape, trusts in it, and makes worthless idols that cannot speak, woe to him who says to wood, wake up or to mute stone, come alive. What is a person who does that trying to do? In the big sense of things, a man saying to something inanimate, wake up and come alive. What have they done? Okay, they're, they are taking the place of God. That's right. And besides worshiping it, besides just bowing down to that thing, you think all the way back to Genesis chapter one, right? They are taking the place of God. 
And so this idol you claim to worship is your own creation. And so you are usurping God's place with idolatry. So we, we talked about idolatry this morning in our Colossians class and how serious that is. So idolatry is, is, is one, of, one of the things that, uh, well, we'll get there in just a second. All right, so look at the very last part of this. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent in his presence. This is the end of this woe section. And so it kind of comes full circle. And the last one talking about creating idols and how idols are no God. You could set them in a temple and there's no God there. But the Lord, Jehovah God, is in his holy temple. And all the earth will be silent in his presence. So, you know, here we have God who has now kind of come forth with this answer to Habakkuk. And his ultimate statement in all of this is, I'm not indifferent. I, I see everything that's going on. I am in my holy temple. And you, earth, all earth, you will keep silent before me. Because I am the holy one. I am the righteous judge. Okay? So, yes. Yes, it is. Yes. The day of the Lord. That's right. That's right. And, and when the Lord comes on that day, is there anyone that can stand? I mean, is there anyone that can raise an accusation against him or, or stand up to him or, or have an argument against him? No. And so all will stand silent before him. That's right. That's right. But you notice something about the things in these woes. Is Babylon the only nation that is guilty of these things? Is there any nation that's a little bit closer to our narrative that is guilty of these things? Uh, yeah. Yes. That's right. That's right. God's people are participating in this. So when Habakkuk says a nation that is more righteous than the Chaldeans, are they? They might not have the military might to conquer like Babylon does, but are they any better than Babylon at this point? Or was Israel at the point that they were taken by Assyria? No. And so when the Lord says, the Lord is in his holy temple, let everyone on earth be silent before him. He says, hey, Judah, you need to listen to this too. These woes are not just against Babylon. They are against any nation that participates in this type of behavior. This is the point. And these are the very same things that Habakkuk himself said that God was indifferent to in chapter 1, verses 2 through 5. And so God's answering the complaint here. God's answering the question. This is the point. The whole earth will be silent in the Lord's presence, and they will await his righteous judgment. And so it's, it's as if Habakkuk, as he's sitting on his watchtower, as he says, is now directly in the Lord's presence. And now he's going to have this psalm in chapter 3. Okay, We're not going to read through the whole psalm right now, but some things that I'd like to kind of note about it. It's, it's the whole of, of chapter 3. Um, so we begin in chapter 3 and verse 1. A prayer of the prophet Habakkuk according to Shigayanoth. Now, I have no idea what Shigayanoth means, <laughs> but there is one other place in Scripture where that word is used, and that is in Psalm 7. Psalm 7 is a Shigayon of David, which he sang to the Lord concerning the words of Cush, a Benjaminite. And so this is a time of distress for David. 
And he says, Lord, look on my adversaries. And it's almost similar to the way Habakkuk starts out. Lord, what, why, why is this person allowed to come up against me and, and issue threats against me? But David's ultimate end in that psalm, and it really comprises the majority of the latter half of the psalm, is the Lord is my shield. The Lord is my strength, and I will trust in him, and he will deliver me from my enemies. We see David's faith in that psalm. And so it's this psalm that kind of builds, builds, builds to an ultimate climax. Well, the same thing happens in Habakkuk chapter 3. It builds to a climax. And so he starts out and he says, Lord, I have heard the report about you. Lord, I stand in awe of your deeds. Revive your work in these years. Make it known in these years. And in your wrath, remember mercy. And as he goes through this psalm, it's as if Habakkuk is standing by on his watchtower and he's watching the battle against Babylon play out in front of him in cosmic terms. Okay, he says things like his splendor covers the heavens, plague goes before him and pestilence follows his steps. The age old mountains break apart and the hills sink down. I see the tents of Cushan in distress and the curtains in the land of Midian tremble. Are you angry at the rivers, Lord? And so, again, nature is responding to the Lord. He continues, he says, you split the earth with rivers. The mountains see you in shudder. He goes on to talk about the Lord in warrior concepts. You march across the earth with indignation. At the flash of your flying arrows, at the brightness of your shining spear, sun and moon stand still in their lofty residence. You trample down the nations in wrath. And so it's like uh, Habakkuk is watching the Lord's justice play out on every nation that is acting like Babylon. And he's just seeing it happen in front of him like a, like a movie or a vision. And he comes to this point in the psalm then. He's seen all these things that the Lord is doing. He's seen the Lord's righteous judgment play out. And then he comes to verse 16. And he says, I heard and I trembled within. My lips quivered at the sound and rottenness entered my bones. And I trembled where I stood. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever had something just shake you to your core and you just get that, that sick feeling in your stomach? Things just kind of shrivel up inside and you just don't know what to do about it except wait it out to see what's going to happen. That's where Habakkuk is right now. He doesn't know what's happening, but he trembles before the Lord's judgment. And he knows that he is something very small before the Lord. But what's his, what's his ultimate conclusion then? Verse, uh, uh, halfway through verse 16, now I must quietly wait for the day of distress to come against the people invading us. Lord, I believe you. I believe you that judgment is coming against the Babylonians. I don't know what's going to happen in the meantime, but I believe that judgment is coming against the Babylonians. Verse 17, this is the most powerful part of the book here. Though the fig tree does not bud and there is no fruit on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, and though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, what are those tied to? Abundant fig trees and abundant vines and abundant olive crops and produce and Abundant sheep in the pen. What are those tied to? They're tied to peace. Peace for who? For Israel, right? Where do we read about Israel, uh, God providing for Israel in abundance uh, in terms of their relationship to him? We read about it in Exodus, right? We read about it in Deuteronomy, right? The covenant blessings and curses. He says, if you will be faithful to me, you will, not, you will not want for anything. You'll live in lands that you didn't conquer. You'll live in houses you didn't build. You'll have everything you need. And all of that is tied to your faithfulness to me. But what happens if they're not faithful? I'm going to take all of that away from you. Your vines are not going to produce. 
your fields are going to be barren, your produce is not going to come in, your women are going to be barren, your nation is going to be overtaken. And so get the idea of what Habakkuk is saying here. He's not just saying, hey, if we have a bad year in terms of the weather. He's saying, if Babylon comes through here and tears down the land of Judah to dust, and there is nothing left. If that happens, verse 18, yet I will triumph in the Lord. Even if someone triumphs over me, I will triumph in the Lord. Now, compare that to where Habakkuk was at the beginning of this book. Lord, why do you look at injustice? Why do you allow this to happen? Habakkuk has now come to a point where he says, it doesn't matter that it happens. What matters is my faithfulness to the Lord and the fact that he enables me to do things. This is, this is Habakkuk's Paul moment, right, in Philippians chapter 4. I can do all things through Jehovah who strengthens me. Though the fig tree does not bud and there is no fruit on the vines and the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, there is no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will triumph in the Lord and I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Yahweh the Lord is my strength and he makes my feet like those of a deer. I don't know if Evan chose that song on purpose, but it was perfect. He makes my feet like those of a deer and enables me to walk on mountain heights. The end. That's it. That's the, that's the end of, of Habakkuk's thoughts. God never gives him an answer as far as if Habakkuk himself is going to be rescued. He never gives him an answer as far as how uh, dire the judgment against Judah is going to be. All he says is, let all the earth be silent before me. Trust me and write it down that judgment is coming against Babylon. You are not the only ones that's going, that are going to be enduring this. I am a just God. Okay, so let's now circle back around to that statement then in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. The righteous one will live by his faith. And that's where the emphasis is in the Hebrew text. If we're putting accent marks over particular words for emphasis, the emphasis in Habakkuk 2.4 is the righteous one will live by his faith. Now, throughout the Old Testament, life is tied to faithfulness, right? Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17, in the day that you eat of it, or in the day that you become unfaithful or act unfaithfully, you shall surely die. Okay, or how about Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6, maybe a more positive example. Abraham believed. What did Abraham believe? Okay, children like the stars of the sky, but in what circumstance? What, what was Abraham's circumstance? He had no children, and he couldn't have children. His wife's womb was, was barren. So from death... Abraham believed God could raise this nation for him, okay? Or how about Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through 20, Moses' final words to the people on, on the mountains. I've set before you life and death. Choose life. Love the Lord your God. Obey him. Remain faithful to him, for he is your life. And so throughout the Old Testament, life is tied to faithfulness. Death is tied to carnal and selfish desire that will never be satisfied. And that is what you see in Babylon. They will never be satisfied because they always want more. And more in terms of earthly more. I want more things. I want more experiences. I want more people. I want more money. Death is tied to that. Now, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. Obviously, we have to read Habakkuk in its context to drive the meaning. However, this very verse is quoted in three other places in the New Testament. So Romans chapter 1, verse 17, that's where we read, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so the emphasis in Romans 1, Paul's emphasis, is faith. Faith is the key there. 
Galatians chapter 3 and verse 11 is the next instance. Now it is clear that no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. And so the emphasis there then is more so on who is righteous, who is considered righteous or justified. It's the one that has faith. And then the one that we read this morning, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he draws back, I have no pleasure in him. So the emphasis then is on the word live. Now, we can't just read that statement in Hebrews in isolation. And I'm glad that Jeff didn't do that this morning. His, his purpose was to move forward to chapter 11. And that's what you have to do with that. The righteous will live by faith. Well, what do you get in chapter 11? You get a giant list of people who lived by faith and what that meant to them. And so the next chapter outlines many lives who lived by their faith in God, often in the face of circumstances that might have threatened that belief, especially when viewed through a limited perspective. Okay, a lot of those people lived in circumstances that were very adverse to faith building, if you looked at it from a limited perspective. However, if you look at it from God's perspective, from the perspective of Scripture, they are not faith limiting, they are faith building. We can come to the same point that Habakkuk did, and as all of those people in Hebrews 11 did, through faith. I don't know how all of this is going to play out. I don't know what's going to happen tonight, tomorrow, or next year. But I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which he's committed until that day. I know it because I have faith in it. And so those people in Hebrews 11, they set themselves apart by conforming their perspective to something greater than just gold or power or places or things like that. These all died in faith. Yes, they died, but they now aspire to a heavenly land. That is the ultimate message of Habakkuk. So the question I guess we have to ask ourselves then is, what is my Habakkuk moment? Or what will be my Habakkuk moment? You know, if, if within 20 years we're all speaking Mandarin, am I going to be a Habakkuk? Am I going to say, you know what, no matter what happens, if nuclear war happens, the Lord is my strength. If, if the nation turns against us and going to church becomes illegal, the Lord is my strength. That's our Habakkuk moment. And so we can look around all day long and say, God, why do you allow, why, why, why is the, uh, the United States becoming such a corrupt nation? And we can offer all kinds of explanations for that, many of them valid. But ultimately, my individual part in it is to believe, as Habakkuk does, Lord, you are my strength and you enable me, enable me to walk along the heights as a deer. All right, I quit teaching and went to preaching, but any final comments or questions about Habakkuk? How can you read the prophets sometimes and not come away with something good? They get such a bad rap because of all the doom and gloom, but there's so much good in there as well. And so if we can come to the same type of place that Habakkuk does, then we'll ultimately be better off. And, and I think that's where we're supposed to go. And, and quite honestly, I believe that's the perspective that Jesus had as well. Though my hands are nailed to a cross and I have scars all over my back and everyone that I came to save is ridiculing me and putting me to death. You are my strength. You are the one that I ultimately trust in. And, and he was rewarded for it. We know that. And we will be too if we aspire to that heavenly land as he did and as those people in Hebrews did. Eddie. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. He trusts God. God just says, trust me. And God just says, I do. And that's all I need. That's right. 
That's right. And how many Old Testament characters had to come to that same type of realization? How many New Testament ones had to come to that same type of realization? I mean, Paul could have said, why is all of this stuff happening to me? I thought I was supposed to be an instrument to carry your, your word to the nations, but I just don't get it. But you know what? As, as some people say, it's my pleasure, right? Because it's my purpose. It's my purpose. All right. Well, thank you for any final comments or questions or anything. That's right. That's, that's actually a perfect segue. If you didn't hear that, he, he likened it to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego saying, even if he doesn't save us, we still believe that he is the Lord. We, we, that's right. And they walked directly into the fire. That's right. They were thrown into the fire. That's right. And they, they came out smelling like Purex, right? They were, they were all good. All right. Very good. Okay. Well, thank you for your comments and your kind attention. We will end there tonight. And uh, as I said, we will pick back up with a, a survey of uh, the other uh, minor prophets next time.